Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode we're going to discuss the evolution of the Galapagos finches. So let's jump right in. <laughs> In the last episode, we met the Lava Lizard, which is a member of the clade Lepidosauromorpha, the lizards, snakes, and Tuatara. Today, we're meeting their sister clade, Archosauromorpha, the Placodonts, Plesiosaurs, Ichthyosaurs, Pseudosuchians, Pterosaurs, and Dinosaurs. As we discussed in our Dinosaur Phylogeny playlist, birds are the modern descendants of dinosaurs. Birds, just like non-avian dinosaurs, are found on all continents, including Antarctica, but birds, unlike most of their non-avian relatives, can fly, meaning they can potentially colonize even more remote places than their ancestors could. For that reason, most islands have birds, and many islands have endemic birds. The most famous denizens of the Galapagos Islands are the finches that aren't actually finches. Technically, the Galapagos finches are tanagers, another family of passerine birds related to finches. Finches are contained within the family Fringillidae. By contrast, all tanagers fall within the family Thropidae. And all the Galapagos finches fall specifically within the Galapagos endemic subfamily Geospezinae. There are 18 species within Geospezinae organized into five genera. Geospeza, Camarhynchus, Certhidia, Pinaroloxius, and Platyspeza. Interestingly, the Cocos finch... Pinaroloxius inornata is the only species of so-called Galapagos finch that doesn't actually live in the Galapagos. So, a Galapagos finch that isn't a finch and doesn't live in the Galapagos. Instead, as the name suggests, this bird lives on Costa Rica's Cocos Island. It brings to mind Stephen Jay Gould's quote, quote, The Irish elk, the Holy Roman Empire, and the English horn form a strange ensemble indeed but they share the common distinction of their completely inappropriate names. The Holy Roman Empire, Voltaire tells us, was neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. The English horn is a continental oboe, the original versions were curved, hence angular, corrupted to English, horn. The Irish elk was neither exclusively Irish, nor an elk, close quote. The Galapagos finches immigrated from either the South American mainland or the Caribbean between 2 and 3 million years ago. The closest relatives of the Galapagos finches, like the dull-colored grassquit, Asimispeza obscura, and sooty grassquit, Asimispeza fuliginosa, live in western South America, but the next closest relatives are a bunch of Caribbean tanagers, like the St. Lucia blackfinch, Melanospeza richardsoni, the Barbados bullfinch, Loxagilla barbadensis, and the Cuban grassquit, Phonopera canora. As a result, there has been considerable debate over whether the common ancestor of the Galapagos finches came from the Caribbean or Western South America. Since Asemospeza forms a monophyletic clade sister to Geospezinae, that could mean either a South American tanager flew directly to the Galapagos, or some Caribbean species instead hopped across the Isthmus of Panama to the Galapagos. As the American flamingo Phenicopterus ruber definitely did hop from the Caribbean to the Galapagos, the latter route isn't especially unlikely. In fact, recent biogeographic analyses have failed to find strong statistical support for one route over the other. The study of the Galapagos finches officially began with Charles Darwin. From 1831 to 1836, Darwin circumnavigated the globe, stopping in South America, the Falkland Islands, the Galapagos Islands, Cocos Island, Tahiti, New Zealand, Australia, Mauritius, and South Africa. While in the Galapagos, Darwin presciently detailed in his journal, quote, The most curious fact is the perfect gradation in the size of the beaks in the different species of Geospeza, from one as large as that of a hawfinch to that of a chaffinch. And, if Mr. Gould is right in including his subgroup Sarthidia in the main group, even to that of a warbler. Seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small, intimately related group of birds, 
one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, one species has been taken and modified for different ends." Close quote. And indeed, the finches use their beak for a variety of food gathering purposes. As a sample of their diversity, the very thin and pointed beak of Certhidia fusca is used to probe leaves for catching small insects, the conical beak of Geospiza difficilis allows it to eat both insects and small seeds, G. septentrionalis, eerily but aptly named the vampire ground finch, is known to attack Nazca and blue-footed boobies drinking their blood, G. magnorostris has a deep, strong beak for cracking extremely tough seeds, and G. conorostris has an elongate yet robust beak that helps it pierce cactus fruits to get at the protein and sugar-rich insides. Later in 1859, Darwin marshaled the finches as evidence for evolution by natural selection, writing, quote, The most striking and important fact for us in regard to the inhabitants of islands is their affinity to those of the nearest mainland without being actually the same species. Numerous instances could be given of this fact. I will give only one, that of the Galapagos Archipelago, situated under the equator between 500 and 600 miles from the shores of South America. Here almost every product of the land and water bears the unmistakable stamp of the American continent. There are 26 land birds, and 25 of these are ranked by Mr. Gould as distinct species, supposed to have been created here, yet the close affinity of most of these birds to American species in every character, in their habits, gestures, and tones of voice, was manifest. So it is with the other animals, and with nearly all the plants, as shown by Dr. Hooker in his admirable memoir on the flora of this archipelago. The naturalists looking at the inhabitants of these volcanic islands in the Pacific, distant several hundred miles from the continent, yet feels that he is standing on American land. Why should this be so? Why should the species which are supposed to have been created in the Galapagos archipelago, and nowhere else, bear so plain a stamp of affinity to those created in America? There is nothing in the conditions of life, in the geological nature of the islands, in their height or climate, or in the proportions in which the several classes are associated together, which resembles closely the conditions of the South American coast. In fact, there is a considerable dissimilarity in all these respects. On the other hand, there is a considerable degree of resemblance in the volcanic nature of the soil, in climate, height, and size of the islands, between the Galapagos and Cape de Verde archipelagos, but what an entire and absolute difference in their inhabitants." Close quote. In more recent years, researchers Peter and Rosemary Grant, along with their students, have written dozens of papers about the finches, concerning their origin, biogeography, and short-term evolutionary trends, among other topics. In fact, the finches have undergone evolutionary trends due to natural selection on human timescales, providing evidence for evolution that would have shocked Darwin, since he thought evolution took many, many years. Jonathan Weiner's 1994 book, The Beak of the Finch, chronicles one example. In 1977, the Galapagos Islands experienced a major drought that drastically shrank many of the finch populations. Peter Boag and Lauren Ratcliffe, students of the Grants, observed as the finch population of Daphne Major fell and fell. Whereas the island had 1,200 G. fortis at the start of 1977, it had 180 by the end, a loss of 85%. In addition to counting the remaining birds, the team also measured their beaks. Fortunately, the Galapagos finches are a lot easier to approach than most birds due to their lack of human interaction. What the team found was that the surviving G. fortis were 5-6% to larger than the dead finches. The average G. fortis beak before the drought was 10.68 millimeters long and 9.42 millimeters tall, but following the drought, the average G. fortis beak was 11.07 millimeters long and 9.96 millimeters tall. What exactly had happened? There are a variety of plants on Daphne Major. Some produce small, easily crackable seeds like Heliotropium, while others produce large, tough seeds like Tribulus. As one might expect, the seeds that the finches targeted originally were the easy ones. After all, why work for your food when much more amenable food is available? But with the drought, this only worked for so long. Gradually, the finches ate up all the easy seeds, leaving just the tough ones. 
Only the finches with larger beaks, who could expend less energy breaking tough seeds, survived and reproduced. Observable natural selection within a single year. Further, at the start of 1977, there were about 600 males and 600 females. But at the end of the year, there were 150 males with only 30 females. The team found again that only the largest males managed to secure females. But then in 1983, the opposite happened. Torrential downpours soaked the island and the small seed plants came back with a vengeance. Now the finches with larger beaks adapted to cracking big, tough seeds were ill-equipped to handle the smaller seeds. Also being bigger comes with needing a larger diet, so now the larger birds were paying the price for their size. As the big seeds began to run low, the smaller finches who required less food were now under positive selection. Natural selection had shifted away from the earlier optimum size. So natural selection does not necessarily simply persist in one direction, rather it can oscillate back and forth. Finally, more recent research has shown that finch beak shape results from variations in the gene ALX1, so researchers have a really good idea of which genes are responsible for those beak changes seen in G. fortis. Another unique species, the mangrove tanager, Camarhynchus heliobates, is one of the rarest birds in the world with fewer than a hundred individuals in existence. Populations of the mangrove tanager are historically known from Isabela and Fernandina, but the tanager has since disappeared from the latter island. Now the tanager is divided into two geographically isolated populations, a larger population on the west coast and a very small population on the east coast. Between the two populations is more than 70 kilometers of barren lava desert and volcanic mountains, and since the east population was discovered in 1900, that means the two have been separated for at least 120 years. Analyses of the east coast population revealed that they are genetically, morphologically, and acoustically different from the west population. In other words, the small population is becoming its own species, which therefore means it is becoming reproductively isolated from the larger population. Considering that the smaller population has only around 10 individuals, this is extremely detrimental to the small population because it will likely face imminent extinction. The population has evolved itself into a dead end, but since evolution is a blind, unconscious process, this sort of event is not uncommon. In closing, Darwin's finches have been instrumental in understanding evolution. They helped Darwin grasp biogeography in the 1830s, demonstrated natural selection and action in the 1970s, and have contributed to genomics in the 2010s. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.